All right, I see the numbers going up and we're starting to share. And I wanna be mindful of everyone's time. So it's 401, everyone had a minute to join the coffee chat. And so just ask you to continue to share it out on your page and tag people so they can also join the conversation. So hello everyone, I'm Crystal Orieva. I am the Senior Director of Policy and Programs for the National Farm to School Network. And thank you for joining our NFSN coffee chat. And today we will be talking to Brandy Brooks, who I'm going to tell you a little bit about, but I just have to say that I love her. I think she's an awesome human being. And so I'm so excited to, as we launch this new coffee series, that I'm going to be able to do it with not just a colleague, but someone I consider a friend and uh, a true voice in this movement. So today's conversation, right? Today, we're going to talk about how do we address racial healing? Because we see so much going on in this country. We've seen it for some, we've seen it since the day we've entered this world and for others, it's been brought to the main stage now throughout the summer with the murder of George, George Floyd that we've really, some people have now really just seen this racial tension and, and are starting to have this in conversation about what it looks like and how we begin to move forward. So before we get started, I wanna tell you a little bit about NFSN if you're not familiar. So National Farm to School Network, we're an organization that our mission is to increase access to local food and nutrition education to improve um, children's health, strengthen, strengthen families, farms, and cultivate vibrant communities. And so as an organization, our new charge that we launched during our mo movement meeting is to have 100 communities, 100% of communities, will hold power in a racially just food system. So this is a big charge. So our organization really understands that in this time, we have to prioritize communities in a different way, that we have to have such a bold public conversation about racial justice in the food system and what that looks like. As an organization, our function areas are really focused on advocacy, people, and resources. So we always look at it like this. Our job is to connect people to people, people to policy and advocacy, and then people to the resources and the tools that they need to be successful in doing their work. So hopefully, if you don't know a lot about National Farm to School Network, you can go to our website, follow us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, uh, and just stay connected with the awesome things that we are going to be doing in the future. So today's coffee chat, right, is us relaunching a series of conversations. And the idea behind these coffee chats is to continue this conversation about racial equity. What does that look like from the food system? And uh, what is shifting power? What does that mean? So our movement meeting, how we launched this big call to action, we wanted to create a space where we can continue these conversations in a laid back environment which is usually gonna be one-on-one -on -one conversations um, that are really gonna be open and transparent and us just saying what's really going on, how you're really feeling. Um, and we're asking other people to share. And if you have comments and thoughts, you can post them. Um, and if, if possible, I'll try to elevate them, but we won't be having like an actual Q and A session with, with those that are tuning in. It's more of just an open conversation. So today I'm excited to introduce this uh, awesome woman for the National Day of Racial Healing, which is part of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, their truth, racial healing and transformation efforts, right? That's what this conversation is about. But when we talk about Brandy Books, she is the co-director of Political Healers Project, a national network led by women of color and committed to centering healing, collective and creative leadership in movement organizing. She is also the founder and chief executive of Radical Solutions LLC and the director of strategy and development at One Square World, providing coaching, consulting, facilitation, and training around racial equity and environmental justice to organizations across the country. Brandy's work over the past 15 years has focused on community organizing and power building, community-based building and land use planning and food justice and food sovereignty. She's a proud Afro-Latina, a daughter, sister, auntie, a cat mom, and an avid reader, singer, and dancer. Brandy was a, also a candidate for Montgomery County Council at large in the 2018 Democratic primary. Welcome, Brandy. I'll give you a moment if you want to add anything to the conversation before we get started. 
Well, first, I want to add my thanks. It's uh, thank you so much for inviting me to help kick off this series for 2021. Um, and, you know, for those of y'all who know Crystal, I mean, Crystal's introduction uh, could be brilliant. We actually, you know, one of the great things is talking about that 2018 Democratic primary. That's how we met. You were running for office in Prince George's County. I was running for office in Montgomery County. And, you know, I'm so excited that we're now getting to reconnect again through working in the food system space. So if y'all don't know more about who this brilliant lady is, then you need to go and you need to look up Crystal Laureata because she is fabulous. So oh, thank also, you. I want to note because, um, you know, as we do these Zoom things, like now everybody's got to get their backgrounds right and you've got to like figure out what your whole game is. So you know, I want to know, I want to note my book's background, particularly highlighting, I'm really excited to have my copy of Freedom Farmers by Dr. Monica White uh, about Black folks and the use of agriculture as resistance. So that's one of my fun new purchases. Uh, and I'm using my mug game to highlight Impact Silver Spring, which is a great organization here in Montgomery County uh, that's really made a strong commitment to advancing racial equity and doing deep transformative work with folks in its network. So I love that. See, I need to see already teaching me taking notes. I'm going to be changing my poster background. <laughs> Maybe I'll retire my Harry Potter mug. Never retire the Harry Potter mug. <laughs> uh, but I do love Harry Potter. I'm a huge nerd for those that don't know. Um, but no, I'm really excited to dive into this conversation. And thank you for that plug and highlight of myself as well. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to start with, for those that don't know, right, with about your organization and what you do. So what is the Political Healers Project? Like, what does that actually look like? And, and what are you guys working on? Yeah, so as, as you read in the introduction, Political Healers, uh, the project is an organization uh, led by women of color. Uh, my co-director and I are two Black women organizers. She's also a, you know, queer Black woman who are deeply committed to advancing our ability to, to exercise the full range of human leadership and particularly around healing, care and collectivity and creativity as healing styles. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we recognize is that for a lot of us, especially those of us who show up or are perceived as women and femmes, um, who are perceived as, you know, who are identify as queer and trans, mm -hmm. um, that there's all this labor that we have to do in our organizations, all this leadership that we exercise in order to make sure that our organizations work and can continue every day. All of this labor that capitalism <laughs> depends on us to do in order to keep things flowing, but that's not recognized as valid labor or valid leadership. And those of us who bring that kind of leadership to our organizations, to our movements are consistently told we're not really being leaders, consistently told what we bring doesn't really matter, even as organizations rely on it to function, um, and then consistently pushed out of organizations for exercising this kind of leadership. Mm -hmm. So we really center the work that we do around women and femmes and queer and trans folks of color, um, those who have been on the front lines of doing this work and on the front lines of having to battle various aspects of structural racism and other forms of structural oppression in our communities. And we talk about through this, through, through the lens of what we call political healing. And we define a political healer as someone who uses ritual to bring cultural trauma into public memory. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanna break down those three things. It's kind of an intriguing phrase. Mm -hmm. So first, we tend to think about ritual in the spiritual sense, and we definitely see rituals there, but we also have rituals in our everyday lives. Your morning ritual of getting up, brushing your teeth, getting washed and dressed, our rituals in our organizations of staff meetings or regular events that we hold, um, our rituals in our public life, like voting and elections. And these rituals are all designed to tell us something about who we are mm -hmm. and who we are in relationship to other people. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that is consistently present for us is that as we look at ourselves as a collective of society, there are cultural traumas that we have experienced as a collective. And these are events that forever change the way we understand the world, our identities, and our relationships to one another. So when you look at the political entity that's currently called the United States, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, native genocide and land theft is a cultural trauma at the heart of the formation of the United States, as is chattel slavery. Mm. Um, whiteness, and actually the push to assimilate into whiteness is a kind of cultural trauma. What that required for both European immigrants from different places as well as black and indigenous of people of color was to, in order to be accepted within this framework of white supremacy and white folks being dominant, you had to strip yourselves of culture. You had to, and you also had to accept your own dehumanization as an agent of other people's dehumanization. Mm. Massive cultural trauma that we don't talk about. Um, other cultural traumas like the Great Migration, the period from about 1910 to 1970 that impacted more than 6 million Black folks and radically changed the demographics of the United States as Black folks fled from the South to the North and West in order to escape racial terror. Mm -hmm. um, each of these things has transformed the groups that were impacted in radical ways and shifted our relationships to one another. Mm. Um, but this third concept, public memory, is the one that I think is most important because what we choose to remember or not to remember is critical in our understanding of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of those cultural traumas that I just mentioned that we are constantly in this position of, of being told to like forget or push aside as important. The Great Migration, most people don't even know that that's a thing. Again, largest internal movement of people in the United States, and we don't learn about it, most of us in school. Um, we're in the middle right now of this massive cultural trauma of COVID and racial injustice and an unprecedented ecological crisis. Mm -hmm. Each one of those is a trauma on their own and they're happening all together. And I remember, um, you know, 20 years ago after 9-11, how there was this theme of like, never forget. Mm -hmm. And each one of those 3000 lives that was lost in that day was, was absolutely precious. Mm -hmm. And we said, never forget, because we were like, these are precious lives. Mm -hmm. We are about to reach 400,000 people who have died due to coronavirus in the United States alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I am wondering, as I have been watching our response to this, are we going to, mm -hmm. it feels like we're not even remembering as it's happening to us. Mm -hmm. And so as political healers, what we want to do is say, no, we're not going to bury these things that are happening and have happened to us. We're going to bring them forward so that we can actually heal from those traumas. Because if we can't, then we can't go on to live lives of wholeness and fruitfulness. Mm -hmm. going forward. I just love the way you articulated that. And I think it's really important when you're having conversations of healing. I think sometimes people think and we're programmed to think healing is getting over it, just mm -hmm. pushing it aside. Like that's what healing looks like. It's like yeah. no more talking about it. It's, you know, pretending like it didn't happen and it exist, right? Um, but really to heal, it's like, needing that opportunity to discuss it, to unpack it, to have it validated and right. Like you need sometimes those conversations as individuals. And I think sometimes we're programmed to not think we need those things that we don't need to talk about it, that to heal is just to move on and sometimes forget, but like that crucial part of healing is that unpacking and that conversation and talking about it. And I, I really think articulating it like that um, highlights what healing really looks like and what's really needed for healing. And so that Absolutely. kind of goes into that, that part that you mentioned about what's happening right now, right? We have all of these issues just packed on each other. Mm -hmm. uh, 2020 was just... 2020, right? <laughs> and 2021 has um, started off with a bang, right? So oh. it, when we look at just the current state of America, right? And we'll just even put it in that context because when we talk about race, it's not, a lot of people think that it's in the confines of the US, but race relations and anti-Blackness and these large conversations are so much bigger than just what's happened in the US. Mm -hmm. But for the context of this conversation, what would you say, or how would you describe as the current state of race relations in America? I know, yeah, like, um, 
pretty darn bad. <laughs> I think to, to put it mildly. And, you know, there's an interesting thing as I was reflecting on this question earlier today. And, you know, I think it's pretty darn bad. And it's also bad in the way that it's always been. It's just how that manifests morphs in, you know, in different cycles of time as we deal with racism and white supremacy in within the United States. And so, you know, I was thinking that the biggest thing that I see is that there's a fundamental difference in the perception of reality that continues to fuel our inability to have healthy relationships between um, racial and ethnic groups. I mean, we can go back to the whole history of how race is defined anyway, and the fact that that was entirely defined as a tool to be able to dehumanize non-white people in order to justify treating them as objects, as cargo, as property, and taking over their land. So, you know, you start there. Um, but, but that's the first reality that people had to dissociate themselves from in order to perpetuate um, white supremacy is to say these other people who are clearly right in front of me, clearly human. Mm -hmm. I know they're human because some of us are willing to go and produce children with them. So we know they're human. Mm -hmm. um, we know they're human because we can relate to them. We can talk to them. We know they're human. Um, but I'm going to pretend for purposes of profit and get the gain of wealth that these folks are not human. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you go through the period, you come to the period after the Civil War where, um, oh, and the thing I can't ever forget, the, the Three-Fifths Compromise, which is still, ooh, I, folks are like, get over it. It was amended. I will never get over being declared 60% of a person. I'm not like, <laughs> until I know that, as your shirt says, Black Lives Matter, and I'm not still considered 60% of a person, I'm not going to be over that yet. Mm -hmm. But you get to, you know, the period after the Civil War where the Constitution is changed to say, like, no, this is not true and we should all have equal rights. And then you get into what I call, like, the separate but equal denial of reality. The idea that somehow you can say, all right, look, just, just put Black folks over there and we'll go have our white stuff over here and, that, and that'll be fine. And we'll all be equal and everybody will be fine with it. Denying the fact that the reason for that separation in the first place is because you didn't want black mm -hmm. folks to have equal things right. you didn't want them up in the same spaces so that was never going to be equal and in fact when black folks went during that period and said fine we're going to go form our own towns we're going to go do our own things they were their, their towns were burned people mm -hmm. were massacred merely mm -hmm. for existing mm -hmm. so again this idea that it's like oh we just want to be separate but we want to live in peace total lie and so you have to deny right. that reality and the current denial of reality is the idea that those things that have happened in our past um, either uh, are still in here and something like that racism is still a thing or that the legacy of racism and slavery is still actively being felt right now or that any of us are part of continuing that legacy or have any responsibility to change it. Mm -hmm. And you see this in things like the Pew Center um, does these surveys on race relations in the United States. And you will see that particularly between black and white folks, but you'll also see this um, as well with native folks, um, Latine folks, Asian and Pacific Islander folks, that um, the perceptions of reality around whether or not there is truly like structural racism, whether or not whiteness confers benefits, whether or not um, we are gonna achieve equity in our lifetime, whether or not we're talking about racism too much or not enough, there are massive gaps, enormous gaps in perception between mm -hmm. white folks and black and brown folks. Mm -hmm. And um, it, again, people talk about this, like the two or more Americas, but that there, there are these fundamentally different perceptions of reality. Mm -hmm. And that feels really important to me because what we witnessed two weeks ago on January 6th was again, people who had been tricked into not believing and not being able to relate to the reality around elections, around how democratic processes work, mm -hmm. around like a whole bunch of conspiracies about what's going on in our country. Mm -hmm. And when you have that kind of fundamental break with reality, 
it's really difficult to figure out how you do that healing because yeah. we have got to come to some level of agreement. Not that there can't be multiple perspectives mm -hmm. on a thing, but we've got to be able to come to some common shared playing field about acknowledging the reality of our history and our present together so that we can figure out what we are going to do together. Yeah, I think that idea of two different realities, especially that idea of like two or more different Americas is so true. And, and what you said about what we all witnessed happening in DC at the, our nation's capital was to like that idea of one, the connection with what was really happening in that moment, but then also what those images depicted is the reality of, of white privilege, right? Mm -hmm. And the reality of how um, your skin color alone can dictate your treatment in this country. And it really ties back when, when you ask people, what does that tangible white privilege look like? Um, mm. It's like now I have an like an example of a photo comparison that's helpful mm. in real time yeah. that I can point you to, right? Because I think again that shared that shared thing we can agree to. I hope we can all agree to after witnessing the protests around Black Lives Matter around the country and witnessing what happened on the Capitol. What we can agree to is that if those protesters if we're using that term very loosely in this context, um, were people of color, would they have been treated the same based on a context of reality that we can all go back and point to, right? Mm -hmm. And I think some, for some people, they'll be like, yes, it, it's this, or they'll say these, there's a difference of why that they were treated. There was always an excuse mm -hmm. for the blatant difference of treatment between the two groups of people. Yes. Um, and so that conversation about at least a shared understanding mm -hmm. of reality, I think is so crucial. And I, I just can't echo that um, enough, right? Yeah. And so when we talk about the idea of the shared realities and we talk about this journey, which I think is like a continued journey of healing, I, mm -hmm. I mean, because we're, I, I say that it's a continued journey of healing because we haven't stopped being hurt, right? And so when you haven't come to an ending point of being hurt, you're being constantly wounded. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't had an opportunity to heal completely. So I, when that context of, oh, it was 400 years ago, it was 200 years ago, it's this many years ago, or whatever context of why we should be over it by now, mm -hmm. um, is the idea, not even just our group, our, our, I say our in the sense of me being a black woman, but um, when we talk about Native Americans, other groups that have been oppressed in this in this country, it's because they're continuously being harmed and continuously being um, wounded. Mm -hmm. And so you can't heal something if you're continuously to break the bone, right? Mm -hmm. So when you talk about racial healing, like what does that mean or look like to you mm -hmm if we had to start the process tomorrow, like what would that mean and look like? Yeah. Yeah. I, this is, I think this is a really great and powerful question. I'm very excited to, to, to think about it within the political healers lens. I do want to mention just in, in regards to something you were just talking about that, that image, that new reality that folks have of understanding how white privilege and how white supremacy is working. I want to note that like, this is something that, Again, black and brown and indigenous folks have been saying for a while, like, hey, we're not the ones you need to be targeting. This is something that even security and intelligence agencies have been saying for years. Y'all need to watch out for the danger that is white supremacist organizations launching or getting ready to launch terror. So again, I want to note, like, we want to talk about the, the insurrectionists, but there's also a whole apparatus of folks who decided, I'm going to ignore the reality mm -hmm. of white violence and its persistence. And I'm gonna instead target these folks over here. So you talk about that ongoing hurt, you know, this is something where if we're gonna get into healing, we have to be real honest about how we got here. Mm -hmm. And my mom went through a whole bunch of uh, health issues in 2020. And so I've been thinking a lot about how the body heals um, over the last several months. And when you have a deep wound, 
you know, the, the first thing, like the, the key things you got to do for that wound to heal is you got to actually open it up and, and clean it out. Mm. And then you've got to protect it. You, you know, you've got to build up your body so that it can have the capacity and it can do its designed healing functions because our bodies are actually designed to heal. Our minds, our hearts, our spirits are designed to heal. And that's one of our amazing superpowers. But you have to set up the conditions for that. So you have to fuel it with things that'll help it to heal. And then you have to protect it from infection while it's going through that healing process. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the first thing that I think about um, when I think about healing is that you've got to open, you've got to open the thing up and you've got to start clearing stuff out. We've got to start actually sharing our stories. And this is one of our pillars of political healers that we share our stories and that we say, we are going to tell the truth about what is happening right now. We are gonna tell the truth about how we've been impacted by white supremacy, whether a black person, a Latina person, a native person, an Asian person, Middle Eastern person, or a white person. White folks have been deeply damaged by white supremacy. It is a hugely dehumanizing and isolating framework. So we have got to tell the truth about what has been done to us, what we've been asked to do as agents of this system. And when you think about in South Africa, it wasn't just a reconciliation commission, it was a truth and reconciliation effort. You can't do that without airing that out. And in order to be able to be vulnerable enough to air this out, we have got to let go of shame because either for the things that have been done to us or the things that we've done within the system, we are carrying around a lot of shame. Brene Brown does a tremendous amount of work around understanding our shame and then figuring out how to, how to get free from it. And it is all about vulnerability and actually being able to be open and honest with ourselves and one another about what we've been through and also what we hope for, what we really deeply want and to get there. Mm -hmm. Then we've got to do that healing again, through that radical vulnerability of putting this out to air, of cleaning out what has been put into us. Um, then after that, he, and we begin that emotional healing, we also have a chance to transform our minds, to transform our worldviews, to develop, you know, we've been taught and trained in white supremacy and how to be agents or to assimilate, or at least to find ways to accommodate and cope with white supremacy. We have to develop a new worldview, new visions, new ways of being. And then we have to go take those and take them out into the world as collective action to put that new worldview, to put our perspective, our healed perspective into place. You know, and these are the things that we talk about as political healers, our, our spiritual, you know, story sharing, our emotional, our intellectual, and then our physical embodied healing action to get through this path. And I think when we look at what racial healing needs to look like in America, those are the, those are the phases that we have got to go through in order to actually get to the place where we can experience not false unity, not papering over a deep wound filled with infection and hoping it's gonna go away. No, that's how you lose limbs. Mm. But actually doing the things to clean it out, to set it up for being able to heal, to inoculate it against future infection. Mm -hmm. um, and then to allow our our bodies and hearts and minds and spirits to do the work of healing with mm. one another. Mm. I really like that. And the way in which connecting it to our body and how our body is built to heal and, and that tangible example of like a wound, right? Cause we mm -hmm. all can know that you, you clean it out. Like that's the first thing you do. You, you, so, and to that point, sometimes you have to open it up, even if it starts to see, I have to, to clean it, to make sure but then I think that key part, because I think that sometimes we have done that, right? Like, mm -hmm. at least for my generation, feel like that we're constantly having that conversation and mm -hmm. drawing out what's been done in the dark and bearing it on the main stage. But it's that protecting it part that mm -hmm. I feel like it's just never been done. Like now protecting that and from from this lens protecting that community those people from being continuously harmed while they can heal from the trauma like i don't think there's ever been a period of time 
where I felt like that stage, that step has happened. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to see it in that way, it's like, that's that missing piece because you know you're you know that people are talking about it, right? <laughs> we're in those spaces, we know we're having the conversation, we know we're pushing it out to the forefront and saying, hey, look at this. And we're bringing people to the fold of understanding this is a reality and hoping to change that, um, that, that true reality into some type of blended reality. But that missing part has always, I think, been that protecting so that people have the space to not be re-traumatized or wounded so that they have the time to heal. And that doesn't, and, and, and what Perry makes that so hard is that since this has been generational trauma, mm -hmm. it's not a week long process, <laughs> a few hours, this has to be generational, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. that um, you can truly heal. I'll, I'll never forget this, this note that someone brought up, this conversation someone reiterated that they heard on a podcast. And it was a um, native woman that was talking about passing trauma onto her child through breast milk. Like mm -hmm. that right there, like trauma, like a tangible way in which she was transferring just her trauma to her the next generation and yeah. so when we think about it in those tangible ways you understand that this is not going to be something that can be healed in, in a short time but it's going to have to be healed over generations and and that also leads to as we talk about healing it's like healing from the people right so that mm -hmm. people aren't constantly in afflicting pain mm -hmm. but the problem that's happened with racism in particular in this country is that it's a machine that works without people, right? Because there's, mm -hmm. it's built within the foundation and the structure, mm -hmm. right? And the policy so that mm -hmm. even if um, the people, right, didn't want to institute racism, the structure itself is built on that foundation. So how do you feel like we heal structural racism? Would you say it's the same process or would that look different to actually begin to tackle the structures of racism? Yeah, I mean, I think well, well, one of the things again, like take take this wound. So, so it's 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 long term. It's also got to be super intentional. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got to put a lot of attention and effort. And the deeper the wound, the more work you have to do, and the more like to really build up and heal it. And one of the things you don't do is keep that wounded part in a system that's constantly throwing dirt inside it. And mm -hmm. this is structural racism. Structural racism. It's a machine that's designed to work without intent, but it's designed to use people. It's designed to snatch us all and mm -hmm. cram us into its workings and turn us into cogs in that wheel or grist for the mill if we're not going to be willing to turn a cog. Um, and, and so part of setting up the healing environment in which the deep cultural trauma of structural racism can in fact be healed is that we have got to dismantle the things that are continuing to pour infection back into that wound. Mm -hmm. And this is where, you know, the thing that I was referring to, it's not just the insurrectionists. Folks want to focus on that. But, you know, there's a tool that we use in training where we talk about the iceberg of white supremacy. And that the part, as with an iceberg, the part that you can see most visibly, that is a tiny fraction of the mass of an iceberg white supremacy is embedded into all of our structures. It is embedded into our culture. It is embedded into our education system. It is, it is embedded into our healthcare system. And so we have got to begin to dismantle or, or at minimum disinfect those systems that are surrounding the wound of structural racism that we're trying to heal because otherwise, all we're going to do is each time we get a little healing, each time we start to clean a little bit out, it's just going to be more poured right back in there. And this has got to be deep relational work. One of the key, one of the key reasons why like white supremacist policies in the United States started to evolve was because black and white folks even under the conditions of enslavement, we're consistently getting to know each other as people, forming relationships, realizing 
that they didn't want to be, and this is particularly between white indentured servants and you know and black enslaved folks, and it's like you know coming together as well and understanding that there's a class piece of this as well. There's an economic um, exploitation piece of this, and saying, hey, we actually see each other as humans, and we want to get out of this system together because none of us belong here. Mm -hmm. So folks kept running away together. They kept marrying each other. They kept having babies. So. You know, when you see these first laws, explicitly racist laws in, you know, the colony of Virginia, it is about preventing people from marrying and having kids and running off because they were doing that. Mm -hmm. So this whole system is designed to keep us separate so that we can be put into this machine. And that relational vulnerability is key to beginning to dismantle this, but it requires us to be retrained in against all the ways that we have been taught not to see each other as human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I want to note that this is not, again, this is not some false unity thing, like let's all hold hands and pretend that this is over. This is real deep relationship. Relationships with other humans are hard. Mm -hmm. Other humans, including myself, are pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are mm -hmm. real difficult to deal with because we are all massively traumatized. Mm -hmm. So it is not easy. But when we make that commitment to one another to say, I am going to come and heal with you. Mm -hmm. I am going to believe in your humanity and you are going to believe in mine. And we are going to believe in a world of freedom beyond anything that we've ever seen, but that we know in our hearts and our bodies has to be what we are destined for because this cannot be it, mm -hmm. is when we make that commitment and take that bold and vulnerable step to reach for that thing, mm -hmm. that's how we begin to do this. We do this on a personal level. We do this in our families, in our social circles. This segregation, this isolation, we see it in social circles. We see it mm -hmm. in neighborhoods. We see it in schools. It's been reinforced by public policy. Mm -hmm. And it takes serious intentional effort to break down the different stuff that have been put in place, like measures of what's a good school, mm. which folks don't realize one of the key measures that drives a school's rating is the percentage of non-white students who are in it. So that rating itself is fundamentally white supremacist and folks don't realize that. They're just trying to get what, what they're told is a good education mm. for their young people, but they don't believe, they don't understand that the very definition of that is racist whether or not they intend to be. Mm -hmm. so how are we contending with that in our lives? How are we contending with the ways that we're told that if people don't have a formal education, that they're, they don't know enough and their understanding of the world can't be trusted, even mm -hmm. if they have literally more experience on whatever issue we're dealing about than us from an academic perspective. They have literal lived experience, but we're like, that's not good enough because you don't got letters after your name. Mm -hmm. You know, there are all these ways we are trained to see one another as less than human. Mm -hmm. mm. That point that you made about how we see each other and in those metrics that we're using as like our, our how we're evaluating things, like the framework itself mm -hmm. can be racist. The framework yes. itself. So even you're just, you applying that metric that data point how you're viewing success or failure is built on the back of either a stereotype of or a pressing factor or a devaluing mm -hmm. of a certain group of people mm -hmm. and so how and like so getting away not just from uh like educating yourself, but being mindful of all of those checkpoints that you're using to make decisions, those choice points. Um, and we see it a lot. And I think the nonprofit world and sector, because we all live and die by how we evaluate our work. Mm -hmm. How do we evaluate its success? Mm -hmm. um, funders always want to know how, how is this successful? Like, what are the touch points? And and I think always what we're evaluating, always says, is that what success is measured by? Is right. that how we should be mm -hmm. looking at success? Is that what it really looks like? Mm -hmm. um, and I think nine times out of 10, it's not. No. You know, it, it's, it's either built 
And I think one of the coffee chats or conversations we had earlier, and I guess talking about the whole notion about um, the example is food pantries, right? And mm-hmm. how measures of the success in that industry is how many people you serve. Like, so the number needs to go be on up and up and up and up and up. And mm-hmm. that is how you measure your success. So your yeah. food pantry being in that community for three decades and you're continuously serving more people, you have a great program. Mm-hmm. But is that success? Right. Is it really? Um, you should be going down. Like it, exactly. the, the model should be built on how could we no longer be needed? And be, but because it's built on survival for income and livelihood, mm-hmm. and this has become a business now, mm-hmm. right? That it's all built on survival and needing to exist. So they don't, the, the need isn't about making sure you don't need to be here. The need is about ensuring that we're hitting these numbers so that we can get more funding so that we can survive. It's like that um, nonprofit industrial complex and mm-hmm. how that on it on itself, the world in which we live in and the work that I do and many of the people tuning in now do, how our institutions are also built on metrics and ideas that are built on oppression or racism or stereotypes, or they're not actually even built to fulfill the vision and mission statements of these organizations. And I think having that honest conversation as nonprofits mm-hmm. is like a key first step. And that, you know, I wouldn't say as NFSN, we're saying we've got it figured out. We are just being honest that this conversation needs to happen and that mm-hmm. we are having that conversation internally as an organization. Absolutely. And, and, and you know, one of the things is that going back, so we talk about the nonprofit industrial complex, mm-hmm. but, you know, even, even digging further, like what is that motivated by? Mm-hmm. That is motivated by the system of capitalism and wage labor. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to, I was actually talking to my pastor the other day and he was, he was referring me to Reverend James Lawson, who was a, you know, spiritual counselor and someone who walked with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And uh, in, as part of his uh, eulogy for, for um, I think it was John Lewis, he was talking about the idea of plantation capitalism. And my pastor was raising that phrase and I was like, but is there any capitalism really that isn't plantation capitalism? Because it's pretty much all built on that model. It's all built on having a pool of low wage disenfranchised workers on generating profits up, on constantly wanting to get bigger, which, you know, the only things that grow and get bigger without limit in the, you know, in biology are cancers. Like, you know, so, but, but these are the things, cause we're told we have to provide jobs for people so that they can get their basic needs. Cause we don't have systems that provide their basic needs. We're told that in order to do that effectively in this competitive capitalist market, we have to grow bigger and bigger. And we have to prove that we're better than this other person over here, as, a, as opposed to thinking ourselves as a cooperative and a collective all to work toward this. We're told we have to continue to exist. Otherwise we have no value in capitalism. Like these are deep, deep messages. And then they get translated into this sector that is supposed to be about helping to heal wounds and like meet needs in the gap between what our public sector and our private sector does. But it's driven by that same ideology. Our public sector driven by that same ideology Mm -hmm. that says all these things about what our relations to each other should be, what our value to one another is. Mm -hmm. And then we perpetuate it. Even those of us who are deeply committed to doing good, this is what we're trained to do to survive mm-hmm. in white supremacy, in cis heteropatriarchy, in capitalism, in mm-hmm. all these other forms of structural oppression. Mm-hmm. Exactly that. And I think what I'm excited about is that I feel like there is a moment in a conversation that I, that I see happening um, with corporations and with nonprofits that are realizing that, okay, we see how, what the structure and how we exist currently is not really in service of our mission, not really in service of our vision, not really in service of the stakeholders that um, we're claiming Mm -hmm. to uplift and center and that um, people are open to reimagining the way in which we do our work. Yes. reimagining how we evaluate success, 
um, reimagining the the standards that we create for ourselves on in in that day to day work. Mm -hmm. But we talked a lot about kind of the, what I call like the weight of the the current world we're in and um, the weight of the conversation about around racial injustice and racial equity and what that looks like in the process of healing, which is so much work. It is not easy. It's why people tend to not want to have these conversations, why people tend to not want to do this work, because it's emotionally and physically draining. Mm -hmm. So in that lane of conversation, what would you say that self-care looks like, right? When we talk about um, racial tensions and you could say that what that looks like for you as a, specifically as a woman of color, but how does that self-care look like when we have to live this reality every single day, if it's part of a new cycle or not part of a new cycle, it's just the current reality. Yeah. So I learned a lot about self-care in 2020. <laughs> um, I learned a lot about self-care in the midst of multiple traumas. And it actually comes down to starting with reclaiming my own humanity. One of the biggest narratives I had to battle was the idea that I wasn't allowed to rest and that if I took a break, it was me being lazy. Again, this is an idea that directly comes through uh, you know, capitalism and the idea that I've always got to be producing in some way that the system can see and validate. Um, but it also came from, I've always got to be, you know, especially as a black woman, I've always got to be hustling to prove to people that I'm reliable or that I'm a good leader or that I'm a good team member or that I'm responsible with the things that I'm given because there are all these narratives that say I'm not reliable, like black women aren't reliable and they're not responsible and they're not serious and they don't know how to get things. So I'm always feeling like I got to be hustling. I got to be proven who I am. And so the idea of rest is like, you can't pause that for a minute because mm -hmm. like, if you pause, you're, you pause, you die. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I had to actually my co-director and political healers, Michaela Lovegood, who had to set me down in May and be like, you are about to have a mental breakdown. You need to stop. And she made me have to tell the truth to myself about the narratives, the things that I was implicitly and explicitly saying to myself in my head about what it meant for me to stop and who it meant that I was mm -hmm. if I took rest. And it was, a, I mean, it was a big, she spent like an hour on the phone with me, Lord love her, while I was just like crying and fighting with myself. Mm -hmm. And then finally made me take a break so that I didn't lose my mind halfway through the year. And I'm deeply grateful for that. So I had to learn how to take rest. I had to learn, I'm still in this process of learning how to value my black body, mm -hmm. which I'm told in this society is ugly, mm -hmm. is undesirable, is unattractive, always needs to be changed in some way. So this is the healing practice and the healing journey that I'm going through is to reclaim and to love and to hold on to my joy of who I am, how I've been created, what has shaped me and the beautiful person that that has turned me into, mm -hmm. to hold on to the things, um, not the things that other people have told me in this system that I have to make myself into, but to look inside myself and say, I actually want to acknowledge the inherent beauty and goodness and joy and love worthiness mm -hmm. that is within me as a human person. Mm -hmm. And then I want to arrange the way that I think about the world flowing out of that deep rooted understanding of myself. Mm. Yeah, I, I so resonate with that, with that idea, you know, as a black woman mm -hmm. um, of like, you don't have the luxury. It's like what I tell myself, you don't have the luxury. And then I just finish the sentence, you know, mm -hmm. I don't have the luxury yep. of sleep. You know, I don't have the luxury of yep. a mistake. I don't have the luxury of anything. Right. And, mm -hmm. and it's, partly inflicted upon me and partly self-inflicted right and I would have to agree like I came to that realization I think honestly part of that realization was working in a new space and organization right like mm -hmm. I part of my career and in, in being where I am um 
at the level that I am, right? I'm senior director of a national nonprofit that which in a movement and industry that is very white, right? Like how does that happen? That happens with hard work, constant work, constantly feeling like I, you know, you have to be better and overperform and your mm-hmm. resume needs to be like, yep. just beyond, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you really need to, and you need to like, once you get in, you need to work insane hours to then say, yes, I was all those things you thought I was going to be. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'll say this, am I embarrassed or not, but our executive director, um, for those that haven't had the pleasure of meeting her, um, Helen Dumballs, like that relationship that I have with her, which is a white woman, our current executive director, has really helped me understand that I can take a break, like that I can don't have to be on 20 all the time, like yep. telling me, Chris, you need to take a vacation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you need to take a day off. Um, you, you know, uh, cause I remember when I was, I was sick with COVID, I got diagnosed with it early on and I did not take the whole time off. Uh, I felt like I couldn't. So I just was off video, mm-hmm. still answering emails, still working. Um, because we were transitioning an employee out and so on in. And I was just like, well, I just can't take off. And it got to the point where, well, no, Chris, you need to take off um, and rest. And, and having that open conversation with her where I just said, I have never felt like I can say to my boss, I don't have the ability to do that. <laughs> I don't have the time to do that. I feel swamped. I have too much on my plate. I, I don't think... I just realized if you add something, I just say, okay, I'm just going to be up till two o'clock. You know, mm-hmm. I just got to find the time. It's 24 hours in the day. Mm-hmm. Crystal, find the time to get it done. And so this is something to say to, to other people. And especially when we talk about the allies and accomplices in the space, it's like, it took for that open conversation for me to, start because i i'm a workaholic i'm working on it but to start um being okay and comfortable and it was her listening to me saying i hear you what you're saying but i didn't get here i don't have the luxury of that helen like your reality and my reality is different her hearing me and then me hearing and trusting her that Mm -hmm. if i do say helen i can't do that or i'm swamped that there's not going to be a there's not gonna be a consequence. It's creating that environment where I trust that she meant it when she said that she wanted me to value my time and my yeah. mental space. And that if I needed a day off, she meant it. It wasn't like, oh, I'm saying that, but not really. Cause if you take a day off, there's gonna be consequences. If you, mm-hmm. if you tell me you can't deliver when it, your review comes, there's gonna be consequences. Yep. So I think just that point you made is so crucial and the charge I'm having to everyone listening that as a, that's in a managerial or supervisor or position is that mean that when you say you value self-care as an organization, if you say you met, you really value self-care as a supervisor and a, and a, someone's boss, that when that person comes to you and says they need that moment, that it, you don't then look at them like, why'd you need the time I said you could take? Because we say it because it sounds good, but there's always that difference between the reality of something and the perception of something. And so I, that's just the charge I put out there for people that have the power to create a culture that really does value self-care. Yeah. And you have to mean it. And then you also have to practice it yourself. Yeah. So if your boss is constantly telling you like, this is fine, but then the way that they operate or the way that they communicate with you says, nope, actually, this is not the cultural standard and you should be always on. People aren't going to believe that that's real. They're going to do what you do, not what you, you know, they're going to, they're going to see that. And, you know, this goes back to what we we're talking about, about healing structures. Mm-hmm. You've got to create structures that allow for healing, organizational structures that allow for people to take time off when they're sick, that allow for people to have space to create if that's one of the aspects of their job that allow for people to invest and develop themselves this requires restructuring our organizations to support and value those things so you can't just tell people i want you to take care of yourself and develop yourself and be creative and then have a structure that makes that next to impossible Mm -hmm. Mm 
So true. So true. And so I know we're rounding up on the end of our coffee chats. So I have two last questions I'll put together as like a uh, two for one. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to ask, because there's always this conversation about whose responsibility is it, mm -hmm. right? To like own this work and to push this work and to keep it moving. And so just like diving into that conversation about when we talk about this racial healing work, who owns the responsibility if anyone owns the responsibility or if it's a joint responsibility and then lastly anything that you want to highlight that you guys are currently working on to combat this issue or to address the issue of racial healing yep so um two things i want to say i actually want to shift this frame a little bit yeah. from responsibility to who needs to heal mm. Mm. <laughs> and the answer is at least from my experience of humanity, every single one of us. So mm -hmm. the question is, it's about the choice. Are you going to make a choice to actually heal or a choice to remain broken and inflict brokenness on others? That's the choice. And you get to decide how you want to show up in this world as someone who is going to be healing and bringing true reconciliation or as somebody who wants to stay in their brokenness mm. and, and inflict it on other people. Mm. So, and each one of us has a role. Like when I look at black folks and indigenous folks and other folks of color, um, there's, there's healing we have to do by, for ourselves because we have deeply internalized structural oppression. One of the things I think we got to talk about among black folks is the way that we internalize and then act out structural racism and classism and cis heteropatriarchy on each other. Mm. How have we been trained to damage each other? as a response to the traumas that we have experienced. So that's gotta be part of our healing. White folks have to dig into what is the actual trauma of white supremacy that has been put on me. White folks like to sort of say, oh, that's like, I'm doing this for people of color. I don't need you to do nothing for me. Mm. I need you to do what you need to do to heal yourself as a person. Mm. I, which means contending with the ways that you have been dehumanized by the system. Because you are not a superhuman who is somehow isolated from the impacts of white supremacy. That is a white supremacist thing to think that somehow this only affects brown people and white people are totally fine. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's some of the healing work. If you are in a position of power where you can shift policies, systems, structures, that's part of your responsibility for your healing work. If you are in groups where you all don't have power yet, getting, building relationships with others and building your power so that you are able, this is part of our healing work. So each one of us has these healing opportunities in our personal sphere and in the public sphere. And it is our choice about whether we are ready to begin healing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as we close, I wanna invite folks to some of the stuff that we are doing. We have, um, our first healing circle, uh, for, or actually not our first healing circle for 2021, but our healing circle that's going to kick off our 100 days of healing. So it's our platform for repair healing circle that's going to be taking place this Thursday, January 21st at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, you can find out more about that if you go visit us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash political healer all one word. Um, you'll also be able to find us on Instagram and Twitter, again, with that handle political healer, all one word. Um, and I think we'll be sharing some of the links to that um, in the comments on this live afterwards as well. I also want to invite people to support our work. Don't just thank Black women, support the leadership of Black women and Indigenous women and other people of color. Uh, there's an opportunity to invest in our 100 days of healing, the way that we're going to be rolling out healing practices, our, again, our platform for what repair looks like in the public policy space. So not just turning back to the clock to what's normal, but actually saying what's normal was already deeply wounded. So we actually want a platform for repair and true healing. And there's a lot of different work that we're going to be doing with organizations across the country around that. So if you go to politicalhealers.org, and you click on our donate link, or again, we're going to be sending out a link to our current campaign and you can go and invest in that work and also find ways to sign up yourself. If you want to be part of our healing circles, our healing work in your organization, um, this is a way to start taking those first steps. 
Yes, thank you so thank much. You, thank you. Like Brittany mentioned, we dropped, I just dropped the links in the chat. So if you guys want to stay connected, I've dropped those links there. So you guys can reference what Brittany just mentioned and just taking the time to thank you so much for such an awesome conversation, Brandy, around racial healing and what that looks like and just the current state of reality. And I know um, just from reading some of the chats that everyone was taking nuggets of the information that Brandy really put forth today. And I am never disappointed by any conversations that I have with you because I always tell people or tell, I haven't told you this, Brandy, I always want to put you in my pocket and carry you around with me and like pull you out to give me words of encouragement and inspiration. Um, I truly feel that way about this woman. And um, she talked about earlier radical solutions. They are the equity consultants that we National Farm to School Network are using for the work that we're doing. So I know many organizations that are um, tied and know about NFSN have really been praising us about the work and the journey and the place that we are in currently. And a lot of that is contributed to the work that Brandy and her organization have been doing and the journey that they're helping us facilitate internally so that we can do the work externally. Because I always tell um, people that want to do, you know, this racial equity work, that it's not about the organization doing the work when the individuals that are doing the work haven't done the work right yep. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do the work as staff individually internally as an organization so that you can truly do this work that you're outputting from like the right place because sometimes just not having the proper intentionality behind the work can cause so much harm because um, you're doing it because it sounds good and it's the current hashtag, but not because mm -hmm. you truly understand what it means. You truly understand um, the weight of the work. And so again, thank you guys for tuning into this conversation. Thank you, Brandy, for your time. Please share, share, share this out with everyone so that they can start to join our conversation and series. If you want us to have a certain conversation, please um, let us know, message us here on Facebook and say, I'd love to have a topic about funding and equity or, or any type of topic area. If there's someone that you'd like us to reach out to or hear that you want to elevate in one of these coffee series, again, please let us know. The idea of these coffee chats, again, is to be a laid back, real conversation, a continued conversation around what is racial equity? What does that work look like? When we talk about shifting power, how do we shift power? And even though National Farm School Network, like we talked about earlier, our mission and vision and working with advocacy and policy um, and resources um, framed from a nutrition standpoint, working with kids in the school and EC world, we understand why this conversation was so focused on racial equity, period, um, right? Race relationships, period, not from any other needed context is because there is an intersectionality. And to think that you can only have this conversation from one lens, or this is not my lane, or we don't do this work, or this is not um, what we do, that, that box and that structure that sometimes we put ourselves in organization is the limitation that we're putting on ourselves that will allow us to never truly reach the vision of our organization. And so we're on a journey of stepping out outside of the box in which we put ourselves in to have these conversations that need to be had and to elevate them on the national platform that we have the privilege to have to elevate these conversations to people that might not know or be having these conversations in their own organization. So again, I thank everyone for tuning in. Join us next month for another coffee chat. I'm Crystal Rea, the Senior Director of National Farm to School Network. And again, thank you, Brandy, for joining us today. Thank you so much. And I'm not going to end this without giving props again to Crystal. Crystal, thank you for your leadership organizing these coffee chats, for your leadership at NFSN and in the state of Maryland and all the work that you are doing. Um, you're amazing. Thank you for doing this. Thank you so much, Brandy. I appreciate that. All right. See you guys soon. Bye.